What? Did you really think I was gone? Nope, just really busy and working on other things. Where's Jurassic Park? But I leave for five minutes. Two months. Because there was nothing really to talk about. Godzilla minus one. And when I come back, I find Marvel's lateral pass to Sony was worse than Aaron Moriarty's plastic surgery. And with nothing else to do... Could we please get out of this forest already? Marvel has continued burning piles of money like the Joker. You'd think someone would step in and say, All right, enough. We need to stop putting out movies like they're going out of style and start giving people what they want already. But we all know that song in game. Someone suggests an idea that requires only a handful of brain cells, then an absolute moron screws it up by hiring a team of people so incompetent I wouldn't trust them to make macaroni art. Hence Marvel's latest abomination, Madam Web. Beginning with the main character's mother, Praganernant, in the jungles of Peru. She's looking for a spider with venom rumored to have extreme healing capabilities. And after finding the elusive 3D object projected onto a 2D surface, she's betrayed by Ezekiel, one of the assistants who sought the spider for selfish reasons that are never at any point defined in this whole movie. In a struggle with Ezekiel, this woman is shot, but have no fear, as spider people rush to save her with wire stunts that look worse than those from the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers movie. She's brought back to their cave where she's bitten, pops out Cassie like a cork, and then dies. Twenty some odd years later, in the far distant future of 2003, Cassie Webb is an EMT working with her partner Ben Parker, saving people by day and throwing out thank you cards drawn by grateful children by five. One day, while helping someone in an overturned car because no one tried to counterweight the vehicle dangling precariously off the bridge, Cassie goes for a swim. She's resuscitated after having died, and then she starts to have deja vu. The next day, during another emergency at a warehouse with military-grade fireworks, a co-worker dies because Cassie has a vision of a truck smashing into his ambulance, which it happens immediately. And the scene wouldn't have been too bad had an overhead shot of the accident not revealed the truck was apparently speeding into the river. Honest to God, no one has secured the area knowing that there are explosives in this warehouse. Anyway, Ray Epps dies and Cassie is sad, so the plot decides to take the wheel and start already when they catch up with the traitor from the beginning, Ezekiel. He's developing AI for tracking people through facial recognition, which the US government apparently doesn't have yet, and they sent an NSA agent to spy on him. After spending the night together, Ezekiel and his mighty dad Bot of Doom has a nightmare in which he is killed by three spider women. Yes, very superheroish of these people. Anyway, he wakes up and confronts the spy because Ezekiel has more wherewithal than all of the people who go out on dates with James O'Keefe, and he poisons her. And just in case you weren't convinced this woman was an NSA agent, she had her credentials on her. Will her murder be followed up by an investigation by the FBI? No? Oh, yeah, that's right. Hey, FBI, say the line! <sighs> He was on our radar. Yay! So the next day, Cassie goes to the train station, where coincidentally the three girls and evil dad bod are. In her frantic search for the plot, she stumbles on the girls and convinces them just in time to follow her, preventing a preemptive end of the story to save my sanity. So the girls manage to escape while evil Spider-Man is knocking around more NYPD than asylum seekers. After escaping his grasp, Cassie and the girls steal a taxi and speed off, learning Cassie is now, for some reason, wanted for kidnapping with zero mention of a masked murderer. The four head out to, presumably, a forest preserve, and Cassie leaves the girls behind so that she can head back into town to read up on the next act. Meanwhile, the girls knowing someone is hunting them, and even claim the government could track your location through your phone, head into town for food and dance like strippers in front of unknown strangers. While the girls in a movie about female empowerment dance like whores for the male gaze, figure that one out, Cassie reaches her apartment. Reading out loud the notes she presumably has before, Cassie finds a picture of both her mom and evil Spider-Man in Peru. Cassie then returns to the forest to find the girls missing, has a vision of them being killed, and goes off to find them. At the diner, Dad Bod has found the girls, and before he kills them, he gets run over by the taxi with Cassie in it because spider senses be damned. The group then drives to a motel, and that night Cassie has a dream in which she has some weird communicative exposition with Ezekiel where he explains why he's hunting the girls. If you're wondering why Ezekiel would explain his reasons to Cassie, he isn't. 
Cassie isn't talking with Ezekiel. She's talking to some weird dream version of him that was written in to explain his reasons because Hollywood still thinks we're too stupid to understand what was already told and shown to us. The next day, Cassie decides to leave for Peru and dumps the girls off on Ben, who blindly accepts this responsibility with no questions. In Peru, Cassie heads recklessly into the jungle, and after looking down at the map, then up around at the trees, then add a photo from her mom's trip and perfectly matching it to a small tree branch that hasn't changed in all this time, she realizes she's in the right place. Miraculous. This is when the good Spider-Man from the beginning appears saying he's been waiting for Cassie's arrival. Really? You've just been standing here in this rainforest? In a blazer? For nearly 30 years? Why not? Nothing else makes sense in this cheese grater across the nuts. So Cassie is pushed into the same pool of water her mom was in. She has a vision of her mother's memories, forgives her mom, and hugs her in the vision. Again, not a clue. Let's just get past this. So she conveniently learns of a secret ability and then heads back home. Back in the States, Ben's cousin's water breaks, and the two of them, along with the girls, rush to the hospital and are intercepted by Ezekiel. He's about to drop a grenade in it when Cassie, who stole an ambulance, smashes through a parking lot wall, flies a hundred feet over and across the intersection, and Ezekiel jumps into the ambulance! Now, you might have misheard me. Let me be clear, he jumps up into the ambulance that is 20 feet above him, only for it to crash down on top of him. I've been trying to make people laugh for close to eight years, and I have never been that funny. So the obligatory car chase happens, with more panning camera zooms than Instagram reels, and zero web slinging leads to the girls arriving at the same fireworks factory from earlier in the movie. Yep. The place never burned down, and none of the fireworks that can apparently destroy brick walls were cleared out. So everything starts exploding like this was Michael Bay's film school days, and Ezekiel chases the girls to the roof. Surrounded by fire, with the girls dangling over certain death and with no other options, Cassie activates her ultimate move. Three ethereal future versions of herself split off to save the girls. Evil Dad Bod doesn't like this, so he unleashes his ultimate move. Equality. Cassie's big superhero moment is cut short because she stood there with her hands down and face presented. The girls stand there and do nothing because they're absolutely useless, and evil Viva Fry walks forward menacingly, monologuing. It is at this point more of the military-grade fireworks explode, the building begins to collapse, Ezekiel's knocked down to the ground, and the Pepsi sign crushes him. Meanwhile, Cassie falls into the river. A firework touches her on the nose, and then she is saved. And the next day, she awakes in the hospital, apparently blind and paralyzed from the waist down. Don't know when she got her back blown out, but after the adventure she had, I'm sure she wanted some sort of reward. Anyway, Cassie and the girls move into a massive loft that looks like the set of a 90s sitcom, and then she says a line that's just as retarded as the closer from The Amazing Spider-Man. You know what the best part about the future is? It hasn't happened yet. Wow, was that a rough movie to come back to. Let's start with the writing, if you can call it that. Almost every line of dialogue feels like it was written by AI, but that's what you get for hiring the writers behind Morbius, Gods of Egypt, and The Last Witch Hunter. Characters will blurt out what they're thinking at the worst of times as if they have no communication skills. As I mentioned earlier, Cassie wants to throw out a thank you card drawn by a kid whose parent she just saved. She discusses throwing out the picture in front of the kid, who slowly becomes more mortified, like a PETA supporter finding out they kill 75% of the animals they take in. The writers also continue the modern trend of thinking audiences can't figure our way out of a shoebox. Every little thing is told instead of shown. Cassie monologues like a Bond villain in an anime by herself or in company. At her apartment, she reads aloud her mother's journal instead of showing us the brief passages. She, like others, will also comment on pictures. Fucking pictures! She finds one of her mother and Ezekiel, and instead of looking for more clues, she prattles on. 
How about the villain always muttering his thoughts as he's processing what's going on? How could these girls possibly avoid me? They must be working with someone. There is a connection somewhere that I'm missing. Of course, this is only the tip of the iceberg. The girls are useless. They do not receive their powers, so of course I don't expect much from them in that regard. However, when you're being hunted by someone who can crawl on ceilings and throws cops like Patches O'Houlihan does wrenches, I would hope you'd be a little more conscious of your decisions. Knowing the police and a killer are looking for you, then dancing on a table in a diner in front of people is not my idea of laying low. It would be like John Connor tweeting every time he ran into the T-1000. Their stunning lack of charisma doesn't help in their case either. This cast is to Winona Ryder what porn stars are to Gary Oldman. There is shockingly little to say about these girls because they do less on screen than the One Ring. On the other hand, Ezekiel, the evil Spider-Man, has just a bit more going for him. It doesn't help that his lines sound like they were added in post because the dude's mouth doesn't move like he was Nikki Haley's speaking coach. And please, Hollywood, if your budget is so poorly mismanaged and you're writing this terrible, the least you can do is buy the antagonist some abs. Ben Stiller in Meet the Parents had abs, while this guy looks like he's a taste tester for Taco Cabana. What was even the point of him wanting the spider anyway? To get superpowers, presumably, but what does that have to do with developing surveillance technology? I don't know, none of it's explained. Now, despite my absolute disdain for everyone else, Cassie is by far the worst character. As I mentioned, Cassie is an EMT, but she hates people. Why enter a career of saving others when you don't care for anyone? Cassie starts in a position that conflicts with where she should be at this point in her life. This is like character regression without the progression, and she hardly grows throughout the film. Later on, after she saves the girls in the subway, Cassie repeatedly tries to dump them off somewhere, complaining that their parents will be the ones to take care of them because she doesn't want this responsibility. Bitch, you just saved their lives, risking yours, and now wanted by the NYPD for kidnapping. You're an insufferable paradox of duty. But Albelio, she learns to take care of the girls, right? She's... She's saved by the CPR that she teaches the girls, and they all move into a loft together that looks like Fraser's apartment, but that's as far as it goes. She never has a moment of genuine connection opening up to the girls about being an orphan, discussing her resentment towards her mother, teaching the girls about life, or anything. The CPR moment is all there is, so she has as much connection with the girls as Hollywood writers do fan bases. And while I appreciate the attempt at the motherhood theme, it's unearned like a participation trophy. Insult to injury, Sony again hires people who haven't seen any other Spider-Man movies to get a good feel for the characters or read any of the comics to know what their characters are supposed to be like. I have always really loved Marvel movies. I mean, what percent of Marvel movies have you seen? Uh, four percent, <laughs> which is like 15 the... minutes of one. And you name the three Spider-Man uh, Tom Holland movies. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Spider-Man, here's here he comes. Here he comes. That's that's yeah. number one. Yep. Spider-Man, and he's back. And the other one, the last one is um, at uh, the Goblet of Spider-Man. <laughs> More damning, Johnson hasn't even seen the movie. That's Michael Caine levels of don't care. What does it tell you when the lead actress and star of the movie abandons its viewing like the Biden regime did Bagram Air Base? As I mentioned, these characters have less brain cells than a zergling and commit actions most Friday the 13th victims would give the side eye. Cassie commandeered a taxi to escape Ezekiel. This taxi is never tracked down or reported on. She drives around in it without consequence. When Cassie returns, to her apartment, she pulls into an alley, removes the license plates, and then leaves them on the ground next to the vehicle. The warehouse, loaded with fireworks strong enough to level brick and turn sheet metal into shrapnel, was not cleared out during the week Cassie fucked off to Peru. And if this stupidity was limited to the actions of the characters, at least then I could somewhat tolerate it, but of course we've also got more loose threads than furniture scratched up by cats. Cassie traveled to Peru, which means she would 
would have had to fly. So how did this woman, wanted for questioning concerning the incident in the subway, manage to get on the plane? This is 2003 air travel. Security is tighter than a nun's bum, but it doesn't matter because the plot must move along. Speaking of airport, the taxi she stole would have had to have been left there, right? So no one checked on the taxi with the missing license plates? No one bothered with Cassie's ID for the parking or travel tickets? How about, why didn't anyone working at the diner stop the underage girls from dancing on a table? Was the place run by Roman Polanski? Let's go back further to the beginning. After bad guy McNoabs shoots Cassie's mom and runs off with the spider, why didn't the good spider native stop him? There are a million of these flaws, and they occur from the very beginning of the film. I didn't even talk about the CGI on par with Sci-Fi Channel originals, or the reuse of stock footage from this movie. I lost track of the number of times the exact same looping footage of a native spider person moving through the jungle was copy-pasted throughout the timeline. Madam Web is an atrocious start to 2024. Terrible acting, writing, effects, editing, directing, you name it. They all suck, and it's no wonder this movie is going to join the $100 million financial loss club when it is, and I say this with no uncertainty, worse than Morbius. I'm talking Elektra and Catwoman. Yeah. The planned new universe of Spider-Man movies by Sony has officially died, with this film guaranteed by the pathetic box office run which has already fallen flatter than Dakota Johnson's tits. Alright honey, get your stuff together. It's about time we hit the old dusty trail and find our own little corner of the world. Anyway, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.